Sunday, the 18th day of June in the year of our Lord, 1815. The skies are overcast. Underfoot, the ground is quaking mud. It has rained all night. And though I am not a man given to omens, I am reminded that it rained, too, on the night before Agincourt. I have some six to seven and a half thousand men under my command, of whom 24,000 are British, and the rest German, Belgian, Dutch. Against this mixed force, Napoleon Bonaparte has assembled 74,000 veteran troops, all of one tongue, and united in loyalty to emperor and motherland. Today's bruising business will be enacted in an area of little more than three square miles, a shallow basin of farmhouses and fertile fields before the village of Waterloo. From all accounts, Bonaparte holds me and my army in low esteem and means to sleep in Brussels tonight. For my part, I shall seek under God's guidance to confound the Frenchman's presumptions. On this day of destiny, I rose early and rode out at first light to direct the drawing up of my army for the great trials which surely await us this day. Ten o'clock, after a delay for which I was able to detect neither reason nor excuse, Bonaparte unleashed his first furious attack upon my right flank at the country estate at Ougamont, whose defence I entrusted to the second regiment of foot guards, the Coldstream. Upon their boldness and perseverance, much would now depend.
Despite persistent and most bloody assaults upon Ugamon, the coal streamers held their position with the utmost gallantry. In the meantime, my resolute adversary, Marshal Ney, was preparing an attack upon my center with 32 battalions of infantry arrayed in four vast columns. 17,000 men, supported by cavalry, advancing towards the British lines to the beat of drums. I took it to be Bonaparte's expectation that the mere sight and sound of such masses on the march would bring terror to the British infantry and prayed that my men would do their duty and stand fast against the approaching tide. into my lines and at some point succeeded in doing so. It was at this perilous juncture that Sir Thomas Picton elected to launch from concealed positions in the wheat fields a surprise assault upon the enemy's flank with his Highland Regiment, the Gordons, the Camerons, the Royals and the Black Watch.
The naked bayonets of the Highlanders exercised a most chastening effect upon the enemy. This was the moment for the cavalry, the lifeguards, the dragoons, the Scots Greys and the Hussars, under the command of the noble Earl of Uxbridge, to take advantage of the disarray created by the redoubtable Highlanders. And our cavalry moved forward in formation towards the still powerful foe. British cavalry carried all before them, swarming over that fateful valley and up, up the other side into the very heart of the enemy's lines, an irresistible wave of horsemen whose example must surely from this day deserve the pride and admiration of their countrymen. Now, true to his word, Marshal Blucher and his Prussian forces entered upon the scene of conflict compelling Bonaparte to detach two brigades of cavalry and 10,000 infantry to guard his flanks. Marshal Ney now ordered the first of four cavalry charges of quite exceptional thrust and power, which began at four o'clock and lasted nearly two hours. Forty squadrons of Bonaparte's finest cavalry, whose furious attacks were aimed at the British squares, those steadfast rings of men and steel whose bayonets appeared to glint even on that grey and sullen day. Prepare to receive cavalry!
Again and again, the French cavalry hurled itself, spent itself against the British squares. Mad, blind charges they were, each in turn repulsed by my soldiers in the most steady and valorous manner. With the late coming Prussians now fully in the fray, it seemed to me only a matter of time before the day could with justice be called our own. With Bonaparte's hitherto invincible Imperial Guard recoiling and disintegrating before our eyes, I thought, oh, damn it, in for a penny, in for a pound. And standing high in my stirrups, I waved my hat three times in the air towards the retreating French troops. It was a signal instantly understood and chase was given with a will. In those hours of dust, in that Belgian valley, we delivered Napoleon Bonaparte his death blow. victory, but at what great cost. My losses have been immense, unimaginable. Some 16,000 British fallen, of high rank 620 officers killed and wounded, including every member of my personal staff. Marshal Blucher, who has behaved with no less heart and honor, lost just one man short of 7,000. It has been for all of us a day of heavy reckoning. I was, as always after a battle, in a mood of deep depression. So many good men and dear friends gone. Next to a battle lost, the greatest misery is a battle gained. It has been a damned serious business, the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. I hope to God I fought my last battle. It's a bad thing to be always fighting, but the hand of the Almighty has surely been upon me this Sabbath day. Riding back to my headquarters in the moonlight, I heard men cheering me to the echo, even those much weakened by loss of blood and the severity of the day's pounding match. But it is I who, with a thankful heart must salute them. For never upon any occasion has the British Army conducted itself better or to better purpose. The Division of Guards set an example which was followed by all, and there is no officer nor description of troops that did not behave with determination and enterprise. Upon that day in history, at Waterloo. 